right, let's begin. Uh, so welcome everybody and welcome to our panel, uh, New Books in the Arts and Science, Celebrating Recent Work by uh, Eugenia Lin. Uh, my name is Wei Shang and I teach uh, early modern Chinese literature uh, in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures here at the Columbia. And let me begin by uh, introducing our panelists. Okay, first about the author, uh, Eugenia Lin. Um, is a professor of Chinese history at the Columbia University, also a director of uh, Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Uh, she's the author of The Public Passions, The Trial of uh, Shi Jianqiao, and The Rise of a Popular Sympathy in Republican China, uh, which won the Fairbank uh, Prize for the best work on East Asian history in 2007. And the most recent book, the new book, that's why we're here today, uh, is entitled the Vernacular Industrialism in China, Local Innovation and Translated Technologies in the Making of the Cosmetics Empire, 1900 to 1940. Uh, about the speakers, um, the first speaker is uh, Deborah Cohen, uh, Professor of uh, History, of Science and Medicine at the Yale University. Among her publications, uh, she has authored Vienna in the Age of Uncertainty, Science, Liberalism, and Private Life. The Earthquake Observers, Disaster Signs from Lisbon to Richter, and most recently, Climate Emotion, Science, Empire, and the Problem of Scale. Our second speaker is uh, Jin Shu, uh, is Zhang Shif, a uh, professor of East Asian languages and, and literatures in the Yale University. Uh, she's the author of a Failure, Nationalism and Literature, The Making of a Modern Chinese Identity, 1895 to uh, 1937. And also Sound and Script in Chinese uh, Diaspora, among other published works. The third speaker is uh, Kivata, Kivata Shimalara Makrishan, sorry for, if I mispronounce your name, Associate Professor of uh, Social Medical Sciences at uh, Columbia University. She's the author of uh, As the World Ages, Rethinking the Demographic Crisis in the in Old Potions, New Bottles, Recasting Indigenous Medicine in Colonial uh, Punjab, 1850 to 1945, among other publications. So I think after our uh, panelists have spoken, we'll have uh, some time for questions from the audience. Uh, so you should, everyone should see the, uh, um, let's see, the uh, Q&A box on your screen where you can submit your questions uh, for me to uh, read aloud. Uh, so that's the uh, Q&A session. So um, without further ado, let's uh, move on uh, with our um, the author of the book, Eugenia Lee, please. Thank you so much, Shang Wei, and thank you, Jean, Kavita, and Debbie uh, for joining me today. Uh, and I also want to thank the Heyman Center, Arts and Sciences, uh, Weatherhead, and ELAC for uh, supporting this event. I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, we did this earlier. Let's see, there we go. I think everyone, can everyone see that? Shang Wei, we can see this, right? Is that yeah, up? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so vernacular industrialism in China focuses on the maverick figure of Chen Diexian, a man of letters, a professional writer, and eventually a cosmetics magnate. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna try, to, oh, there we go. Uh, Chen lived during the last decade, uh, decades of the Qing dynasty into the Republican era. It was a period marked by weak central states, internecine warfare, and penetrative economic imperialism. Yet, while political chaos reigned, the rise of treaty port economies and print and light manufacturing industries generated unexpected opportunities because the fall of empire had unmoored orthodox categories and professional boundaries and occupa occupational divides had not yet been established. Enterprising individuals could pursue new endeavors, explore forms of knowledge before they were exclusively owned by specialists in academia or industry. It was in this context that Chen proved to be one such enterprising individual. In the West, Chen is probably best known uh, as Tian Xu Wosheng, a novelist of Mandarin duck and butterfly romance fiction. 
But Chin did more than write novels. In the late 1890s, this classically educated Hangzhou man developed an interest in chemistry. After moving to Shanghai in 1912, he began work as a professional editor and translator. In 1918, building on his scientific knowledge and brand name recognition as author and editor, he plowed the money he had made from writing into daily goods and cosmetics into a daily goods and cosmetics company known as the Association for Household Industries. This is just a picture of the, of the company. The company manufactured the Butterfly brand tooth powder which was unique in its ability to double as face powder. The tooth powder became incredibly popular and outmaneuvered Japanese and Western brands in, in Chinese and Southeast Asian markets. By the mid 1920s, now a patriotic captain of industry, Chen became a leading architect of China's national product movement. The book challenges the conventional view that lettered men and women such as Chen were unable to manage the transition to modernity. It shows that supposedly outdated literary endeavors of these individuals were in fact crucial to their scientific, commercial, and manufacturing success. As a playful literati connoisseur of new knowledge, the young Chen dabbled in science. He turned his writer's studio into a chemistry lab and prolifically translated texts on chemical and legal knowledge. But Chen also moved beyond the realm of gentlemanly culture to sell both words and things. He adapted foreign technologies, locally sourced ingredients, and openly pursued profit, activities once deemed unthinkable for respectable men. He wittily drew from literati naming culture to market his modern native, native goods uh, butterfly brand uh, in order to sell his tooth powder. In turn, drew, Chin drew on his fame as a manufacturer to share his adapted formulas as common knowledge or changshi on Xiao Gong Yi, uh, light industrial arts in uh, journals, magazines. Uh, here, this is a woman's magazine, uh, as well as in newspapers. In a moment when Ch Chinese industry was struggling with economic imperialism, Chen's industrious activities constituted a form of vernacular industrialism. This industrialism was local, informal, and part of China's consumer culture. It was showcased as modest and family run, if eventually located in factories. Vernacular industrialism is a key analytical concept in my work and is meant to capture the array of ad hoc, unconventional industry work that Chen and others pursued. These practices have tended not to be included in histories of modern industry, or if they are, they are dismissed as amateur, frivolous, seemingly falling outside of real industrial pursuits. Yet Chen's industrial efforts included writing poetry about new technologies, which served to domesticate translated chemistry and physical knowledge to skeptical literati peers. It involved tinkering with cuttlefish to source locally calcium carbonate, a key cosmetic ingredient. There was also playful dabbling with the foam fire extinguisher, extinguisher in his scholar's studio for which he eventually secured a patent. More broadly, the term is meant to capture how Chen's unconventional route to industry was characterized by a do-it-yourself or even rogue approach. Initially, this DIY approach was necessary in an era when conditions were inhospitable to industry building. Eventually, however, it became an integral part of Chen's nativist brand. Vernacular industrialism is thus meant to decenter long-standing narratives about China's engagement in science, industry, and capitalism. Chen and other classically trained individuals were hardly mired in the Confucian classics, unable to transition to modernity. They were in fact highly able to leverage the resources and skills acquired from the world of letters to embrace new knowledge and create new ro roles for themselves in what was increasingly a globally integrated industrial and commercial world of urban China. Vernacular industri industrialism also serves to interrogate the role of knowledge production in the making of industry. During a period when the production of things and words were increasingly defined by technologies of mass production, Chen's vernacular industrialism was marked by a close interrelationship between his knowledge work and material endeavors. Chin deployed his translation skills and clout as a professional editor 
to produce the knowledge necessary for manufacturing for an anonymous reading public. As a self-proclaimed nativist not able to read a single foreign language, Chen nonetheless tapped into global networks of knowledge by employing practices of so-called assembly line style team translation. To capture the important relationship between Chen's intellectual and industrial labor, I employ the word tinkering. Chen was a wordsmith. He tinkered with texts. He remade formulaic romance novels. He compiled, edited, and translated in a new media market. Chen's nimble improvisation with texts informed his material pursuits. He adapted translated recipes. He tinkered with the manufacturing formulas, and then he improved the product by domestically producing it at a cheaper rate. Uh, these efforts, oh, sorry, I seem to have uh, misplaced. If you just bear with me, I think my printer only came out with one um, page, one last page. Um, so, uh, so, Sorry about that. Tinkering brings me to another intervention the book seeks to make on the question of copying and innovation. Claiming to build a Chinese industry that was native, Chin presented his adaptations of translated technologies as virtuous acts of indigenous emulation, fangzhi, or acts of remaking, gaizao. In an era when modern IP was only starting to emerge globally, Chin's publications on so-called common knowledge, or changshi, unabashedly included translated brand recipes from abroad. Yet even while exhorting other would-be manufacturers to emulate foreign manufacturing technologies, Chen aggressively sought patents for his own gadgets. Uh, in these, uh, he based his claims of ownership not on original invention, but on improvement or gai liang. His strategic engagement with copying were hardly examples of ignorance or deviousness, Instead, it demonstrates how in an era when ideas of ownership over IP were not yet fixed, copying, improvement, and innovation were hardly at odds. This was a time of information, informational and material scarcity in China. Scientific knowledge was not yet ensconced in academia, nor was industrial production in fully mechanized factories. Figures like Chin were active participants in defining the parameters of science and industry and capitalist practices. Not the highbrow May 4th Mr. Science, nor state-led industry that was to emerge under the Guomindang and dominate under the CCP. Chen's vernacular industrial, industrialism was ad hoc, commercial, playful, even explicitly gendered feminine, as this slide here shows. It was branded as no, nativist and local, but depended on his ability to access global circuits of knowledge and technology. If we insist on using formal industrial practices as a standard to evaluate successful industrialization, Chin's vernacular industrial practices would be excluded. But it is precisely the purported unconventionality of Chin's practices that are worth our attention. They for us, force us to re-examine our current categories of analysis that have for so long rendered his form of industrial vernacularity as non-normative. I think I will stop my share and at this point, turn it over uh, to Debbie. Thank you, Eugenia. This is a brilliant book. I'm truly honored to have been invited to discuss it. Um, I'll comment on its implications as I see them for my own field of history of science and technology. First, for rethinking the category of modernity. And second, for moving beyond histories of invention. So first on modernity, which I take to be an aspirational condition, an actor's category. So over the past 10 years or so, I think a consensus has emerged among historians of science and technology that modernity was defined by a series of binary oppositions that privileged one form of knowledge over another. So the primacy of science over technology, of theory over practice, of generalizations over particulars, of representation over intervention. So in this respect, historians of science have distinguished modernity from post-modernity in terms of the shift from science to techno-science, from a representational ideal of truth and a quest for causal explanations to an interventionist ideal of efficacy and a search for 
large scale patterns that may not admit of causal explanation. But this framework that we built up <laughs> so carefully um, over a decade or so can't make sense of Chen, right? A self-proclaimed modernizer who seems to better fit the so-called postmodern mold. So Eugenia's story shows us a modernity that inverts these familiar hierarchies or at least undermines the binaries. Chen offered his readers a modern identity premised on practical over theoretical engagement and he didn't distinguish between the verification of a process and the verification of an explanatory theory. We don't hear from him any of the binary oppositions that we expect from modernists. Why not, right? So Eugenia argues that defining modernity for Chen was at least ostensibly about dismantling hierarchies and social divisions because becoming modern was for him first and foremost, a project of nation building which of course requires alliances across differences of class and gender. Now, I found that this resonates with my own geographical research area, 19th and early 20th century East Central Europe, where science was likewise integral to the work of nation building for cultural nations governed by the Habsburg monarchy. So writers in Czech, Hungarian, Polish, and other regional languages we're inventing new national vernaculars that could serve as scientific languages in an era when the global dominance of English was not foreordained. As in China, in East Central Europe, inventing a scientific language was a literary endeavor. So like Chen, East Central European authors viewed scientific translation as a creative act since they understood themselves to be inventing a national language. Early scientific periodicals in East Central Europe in languages other than German contained an eclectic mix of topics, just like Chen's newspaper columns. Chen's ideal of common knowledge also resonates strongly in this essential European context. There too, authors attempted to engage readers in hands-on scientific activities, usually observation or collecting as a means of nation building. But beyond such regional comparisons, we might also say following Eugenia that textual practices need to be seen more generally as an important part of the work of technological creativity. And here I'd point to recent research on 18th century France uh, by my Yale colleague, Paola Bertucci. Um, her artisanal enlightenment is a history of the emergence of the 18th century persona of the artiste who was neither a craftsman nor savant, um, an identity tied to textual practices like writing histories of craftsmanship and compiling contemporary artisanal knowledge. This attention to the affinities of technological and textual knowledge making, I think helps to provincialize yet another myth in the history of science, that of the two cultures, uh, a neurosis over the relative status of the natural sciences and the humanities that has appeared repeatedly in Anglo-American culture since the late 19th century and that has parallels in contemporaneous German language anxiety over the split between the Geisteswissenschaft and the Naturwissenschaft. So can we say that in both China and East Central Europe, the work of nation building mitigated against such a rhetorical emphasis on disciplinary divides? Um, I think in this way, Eugenia's research also reflects back on histories of science and technology in Western Europe in important ways. It exposes the social function of the standard glossing of modernity with its hierarchical divisions between different modes of knowledge. So thanks to her case study, we can better recognize how Western European definitions of modernity served a class, gender, and imperial politics that pri prioritized a hierarchical epistemology and its associated ideology of meritocracy. And here I think the implications for gender history are especially interesting. Chen seems to have avoided the 19th century European hierarchy of knowledge that tended to link more theoretical, abstract, universal forms with masculine minds and more contextual, practical forms with feminine minds. Unlike European intellectuals at the time, it seems he did not suggest that women were better at following rules than coming up with their own. Also by encouraging the work of tinkering in the home, the inner chamber, Chen also seems to have subverted or disregarded the Western European modernist association of science with public rather than private, i.e. feminized space. And then with his dual authorial identity as science writer and writer of romantic melodramas, he seems to have ignored the Western European modernist move to divorce science from affect. 
So given these moves to link private space and public science, rationality and emotion, I found myself wanting to know a little more about Chen's family life um, and specifically about the significance of family relations for his creative work and for his business. Um, and these reflections on Chen's vision of modernity lead me to a larger question. Chen makes it seem that these boundaries didn't exist in our Republic in China. And yet, um, I believe that other historians of science in Republic in China have suggested otherwise. Um, so for instance, um, emphasizing rhetoric um, on the opposition between science and literature, between science and metaphysics. So I'm wondering, was Chen exceptional in his boundary crossing or has previous literature had a Eurocentric bias, right? seeing oppositions only because it expected to find them based on a Western European model. Um, so second, I think vernacular industrialism is an important contribution in to history of science and technology in that it shifts the focus from histories of invention to histories of use, appropriation, adaptation. So in doing so, it subverts a central myth of Eurocentric histories of science and technology, indeed histories that have been used to legitimate colonialism, the myth of the genius inventor who bends the non-human world to his design. Chen saw through that myth, he perceptively associated the value placed on invention and novelty in the West with market consumption. It's interesting that it was during his lifetime that Marxist intellectuals in Eastern Europe, like Boris Hessen and Edgar Zilzel, likewise began to link the birth of modern science to the rise of capitalism. And in Zilzel's case, to denounce the myth of genius, a myth that he argued hid how much modern science owed to the ingenuity of the working classes. But Eugenia's research not only shifts the attention of historians of technology away from invention, it also pokes an important hole in some of the classic critiques of the myth of genius, critiques um, that simply point to the failures of engineers to achieve their goals. So she goes further to question the premise that science and, and engineering are all about forcing matter to conform to human intentions, right? So with Chen as her case study, she suggests that the real knowledge work of engineering lies not in imposing designs uniformly, but rather in improvising and adapting to local conditions. And in this respect, I hope that the book will be read by historians of science and technology working within the framework of envirotech, which emphasizes the agency of matter and non-human life. So scholars like Linda Nash and Paul Sutter argue that it's highly misleading to talk about technology transfer or diffusion when not only socioeconomic and cultural conditions, but the material environment itself demands improvisation. So Nash, um, emphasizes the agency of matter in the negotiation between engineers and their environments. And she writes, perhaps then it is not technology that travels, but travel that helps constitute what we understand as technology, right? So if we think of technology in terms of solutions that work in multiple sites, and we overstate human agency at the expense of the agency of matter. So from an environmental perspective, vernacular industrialism offers a fascinating example of an engineer who seems to have recognized the limits of his own agency vis-a-vis -vis matter. But I wonder how Eugenie would feel about this reading of that attributing agency to matter. Um, to conclude, I just wanna point out that no one else in the world could have written this wonderful book, which uniquely combines Eugenia's expertise in Chinese cultural history, her sensitive readings of literary sources and cultural artifacts, and her understanding of the methods and concerns of history of science and technology. Um, so Eugenia, I hope you know how much I admire you for taking up a whole new discipline in order to write this book, a daring move that has paid off beautifully. And I hope that your example will be one that others will follow. And in that light, I would love to hear from you at some point, not necessarily here, about your experiences moving into history of science and technology and think with you about how history of science and technology can become more open and welcoming to scholars coming from other backgrounds in the future. Okay, Jin Shu. Yes, thank you. Actually, I, I'm so glad that I'm in some ways following up or going after Debbie because Debbie mentioned uh, some of the questions that I will I will 
go into in the few minutes that I have. But first of all, I just want to say there's so much to celebrate about this book, and it's really a tremendous achievement. And I echo every bit of the sentiment that Debbie expressed. And since I have limited time, it does. This book has given me a lot to think about. There are different directions just because of how rich and panoramic you managed to sh shed light on this entire global history by using this one small, modest, but very quirky um, protagonist. And with that, I mean, sometimes I wonder in some ways, because you emphasize that in some ways, tradition is by no means um, common. And he might be a kind of one of these one-off industrialist slash fiction writer crossovers that actually is quite rare. But I think you're absolutely right that in the May 4th tradition that we then think about, there are plenty of these around who did not stay and joust with the pen, but actually went abroad to acquire these industrial engineering training in places like you know, Cornell, Harvard, or Yale, or MIT, and then brought it back to China with their own kind of innovations. I'm thinking of, you know, typewriter Zhou Houkun, who came back around 1912, around the same time that, you know, Chen Jixian was still making his mark. And he marked on one reason he can't get his typewriter finished, because you go into the, the, the 10 workshops that he went to in Shanghai, and the, the, the gears were made like jagged teeth of old people. So he complained everything. So, so I think you're right that in some ways, because of the pressure, because of what China was lacking, that somehow created this niche for innovations and inventors like Chen Jiexian, which kind of brings in view a question is what counts as an innovator, right? And it seems to me that one angle to take in which you also take is actually about labor. But I'm thinking more in terms of work that there's a kind of transition in the Republican period where work is being uh, in some ways re, uh, re-understood as work that generates other kinds of work, right? Like production generates other production. And but Chen Jiexian is really that transitional figure where work is still exhausted in the innovation itself, right? Back in the days when inventors can just simply sit in their basement, you know, in their homes, like this do-it-yourself spirit, where they can tinker and come up with things, you know, the way Li Mitan made his typewriter in the 1940s. I mean, that kind of genius, so-called innovator is still possible before mass scale industrialization took hold of the direction of science technology in China, right? We have the emergence of professional scientists in 2030s, which you do so well in some ways to juxtapose a figure like Chen Jiexian against. But at the same time, there are other things that sort of hit more at the heart of Chen Jiexian, which is also, you know, we think about the introduction of um, uh, Taylorism in the teens around this time, where work is being measured in seconds and minutes and productivity, and Wang Yun, for one, was trying to apply it to the, to the, to the floor of, of Shangwu Yin Shuguan, the commercial press, to no great popularity, of course. But nonetheless, so we're really talking about Chen Jiexian in this vein of early capitalists, which is not a term that comes up in your book very much, which I, I completely understand, which is because your take is much more refreshing. But in some ways, this does have a longer history in the context of, we think about Zheng Guangying, Zheng Guangying in 18, even though the book Shen Shi Wei Yan came out 1894. So we can imagine in the late 1880s, he was thinking about this idea of Shangzhan, which is actually, I guess, the earliest translation of trade war, where he understood that it is precise in the commercial realm where China is more likely to be eviscerated. And the effects of that would be much more long lasting than boots on the ground, you know, and co colonialists on the ground. So I'm also thinking that Chen Jiexian is part of this genealogy, right? That's actually quite central in many ways to, to central to the kind of neglect um, that we managed to pursue because we've been so obsessed in some ways with words rather than products, you know, rather than things and objects. So I find that very, um, very enlightening. Now, the other thing I wonder about is at the same time that you engage this global history through this micro, micro lens, I wonder how much of a dialogic motion we can make between the two. Because it's true that let's say respond to this, this dearth of resources, it created in the niche and room for one-off geniuses like Chen Jiexian, you know, very innovative, creative, creative people. On the other hand, you know, 1873, when China participated in the World Fair in Vienna, um, they were known for have displayed a whole array of scissors, scissors for cutting paper, for cutting leather, for women's grooming, even for cutting men's nose hair. And it was rather ingenious, but it was not industrial, it was not the tractors, it was not the cordless engines that were already seen in 1851 in the Crystal Palace. So in other words, China actually really suffered 
for this kind of more soft industrial goods, right? Handicrafts, etc. So I also, but you know, you take a very different tone because you sort of think of this more like a, you, you want to give, you know, the, the people at Chinese a lift and you want to put them in the limelight. But at the same time, I wonder if it breaches this kind of national domestic barrier. So to what extent is the celebration of nativist goods kind of a, kind of a, a kind of a trumped up selfie and reassurance, right? That in some ways this 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 conversation this use this celebratory euphoria it doesn't really break through that national into the in, in, into the global. So I also wonder how we can connect that a bit more. And my last my last observation is thinking about at the end of the book you carry it you draw parallels with a great leap forward and what was happening and like I actually never thought of that before and I thought it was rather ingenious to think of this do it yourself spirit actually had a pretty positive origin, right? If you think about a country that's so big where a lot of times you don't have resources, you kind of have to rely on your own strength and a kind of you know, individual empiricism. But at the same time, you know, a lot has changed between then and Great Leap Forward. For instance, industrialization, mass scale production has begun to primary focus. You don't really have one-off geniuses anymore. There's no room for that. There's more like being a cognitive change specialization and the idea of you know, the furnace in, in modernity, um, what, what, that was more of a propagandistic um, rallying of people's support around the idea of Great Leap Forward. Um, so I, I also, so in that sense, I kind of take this a uh, kind of nostalgic, almost mournful tone that whether someone like Chen Diexian, that spirit could have survived through the ensuing decades. And I think you're right that in some ways there is a, we do see a connection between, let's say, the copy culture and the idea of Shanghai. And I think there, there is kind of a loose connection between two. It also seems to me that, you know, the copy culture of Chen Diexian really is kind of indebted to the landscape of Lei Qing and you know, those of you who know that I'm a huge fan of Lei Qing, so it's inevitably that I would want to give that a kind of give it, treat it as a singularity. But it's true that you know, and this brings us back to his writerly life. That you know, Lei Qing translation is the exact parallel, and I thought it was really wonderful how he used that. That just as there were different ideas of authorship, there are different ideas of what translation was. In other words, a product could be kind of finessed; it could miss the vital parts, but still be called the same thing. So, you know, you have different translators who would say this is an abridged translation, a loose translation, a off the cuff translation. I mean, to the, to the point that translation no longer has anything to do with the original, nor does it really profess to be. So for all those reasons, I think this book really weaves together so much and also leaves a lot of strands for us to think about. But I would be curious to see if you, if, if you have time to address any of those. All right, so thank you, uh, Jinshu. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Kimbata. Oh, you have to, um, you, you still mute yourself. Yeah, right, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Eugenia, for joining me on this absolutely celebratory occasion. I'm going to make, what I'll start with is, I want to make a few formal comments so that I don't miss out some of the main points I felt I got from the book. And then I'll progress to some of the questions um, I've had. So this is really a brilliant and insightful new book, uh, which traces, and I was immediately riveted to the career of Chen. I felt that um, through him, you're throwing a light on the pathways, not only of early capitalism in China, but he himself, through his journey of self-publicity, through tinkering, through innovation, uh, through all of that, you take on what I think, and I agree with Debbie and Jing in that sense, this is a really ambitious project. In the sense, when we look at it, when you start opening up the book and you say, okay, this is a micro history, and she's going to tell us this narrative of, of what he does and his life and his entrepreneurship. But it is so led on every count because it's a story that resonates with me as someone who works on you know, histories of indigenous medicine and health in South Asia. So what I feel you do in this book is really, I think most crucially for someone who's watching this from South Asia, you tell us that global industrialism has diverse pathways. That basically what we are seeing is the fashioning of networks and exchanges from Hangzhou to Shanghai and beyond. And through chance tinkering and dabbling, what you have is this world, which was there in many other parts in the early 20th century. It's a world that's in flux with a range of hybrid and blurred identities, both socially and politically. And really Chen is located in this crucial social and technological moment 
of uncertainties and opportunities, very different from that post-colonial colonial moment of industrialism in the 1950s and 60s, when you have a range of experts who are weaving around disciplines and they seem to know that things are kind of consolidated and they have a plan. But what he is, and this is the point of opportunity, and I think you call it optimism in your book, this is where you're able to kind of work on something which is about a moment of uncertainty and flux, where really you manage to link, which I think is very skillful, histories of production and consumption. People write histories of production and consumption often separately. And where commodities and desires and the desires of uh, consumers, you kind of deftly connect them. And you see through Deng basically that manufacturing merges both campaigns and branding, protecting, marketing, and he ranges from this amazing range of fire extinguishers, presses, and cosmetics. So through the early chapters, what I really found very, very striking about what he does is that he adds, you know, there's that whole narrative about him adding a shifting silk screen, improving on more durable ink, producing a butterfly flat offset printing press. This is really a world of constant friction. It tells a very, very powerful story, which is local, but which really tells me also, it reminded me of someone um, who, was a, who was a striking character in my first book called Pandit Thakur Dat Sharma. He ran a huge pharmacy in Lahore. And from that pharmacy, he manufactured something just as Chen's tooth powder served as face powder. Thakur Dat Sharma had a, had a medicine called Amrit Thara, and it could actually be used on the face. It could serve skin afflictions. It could serve tummy aches. It could serve everything together. But from Lahore, he had an empire that stretched to Burma and Sri Lanka. And it was all about trying to, and, and, and what I found very much in common is that this, is, this could be a very different story of capitalist development. And in that sense, I'm tying up with what Debbie is saying, that this leap from tradition to modernity, to large scale capitalism, it doesn't have to be through fixed stages of capitalist development, as we see as being prescribed in the 1950s and 60s. What you're looking at is a moment when things could be different. Basically, you don't need the kind of experts you had in the 1950s and 60s who had to work out and lay down for you certain technopolitical kind of visions. So I found that Chen's world was really special because through household industries, he offers us a world which is far less bounded. He offers us something in terms of the opportunity to integrate common knowledge through his columns and bulletins. And also it's a story of building really an industrial modern that was not top down. You know, it's not really constrained and bureaucratized by five-year plans, which happens in the 1950s and 60s. It's not also premised on the consolidation of formal disciplines and specialization. When you look at biomedicine and specialization in the 50s and 60s, you feel hospitals, uh, specializations all have to happen before certain kinds of innovation occur. But that's something he shows us you don't need necessarily to have the rule of experts. You don't need to have chemistry, physics, engineering, all of that, if you could actually, you know, bounded in certain ways. And he still seeks commercial and, and, and industrial ends through much more, through many more informal practices. And now for some humor, I have to tell everyone that this, um, when we're talking about Chen's, uh, Chen's quest, there's many a time when we're thinking about what he draws from, you know, all the textual competence, his access of local resources, particularly his somewhat mixed successes with cuttlefish bones. I remember meeting Eugenia and Debbie, Eugenia and I have met often. We would meet at Marlow Bistro and often Eugenia would be telling us about cuttlefish and having been raised in Delhi, not seen much of the sea and being a vegetarian all my life, I had to really look up to see what cuttlefish bones were. But you know, in so when I read chapter four, I could see that epiphany that you spoke about when he's standing there and he basically sees the sea and he sees these cuttlefish and you weave it so nicely into this, this, this vision of smash, smashed cuttlefish with what he wanted to do, basically try to make up for this erratic flow of raw materials and looks at, and he does other things very successfully, even if this is a kind of epiphany that he has, but he does this, he makes this leap to domestic adaptation of manufacturing. And he moves not only, you know, from someone who, in, and it shows the potential of the local because his household industries really grows and it gets relocated in the 1940s. So I want to come to a couple of the questions I want to pose to you. Uh, the first is really when we think, you know, Chen writes about and invokes commercial and moral goals. He says that certain forms of commerce are virtuous and patriotic. He refers also in your book to saying that technology can be honorable. 
all these are attributes he wants to associate to, with, you know, with, the, uh, with butterfly products. So it really reminded me in some ways in India of Gandhi and others justifying their support of small and local industry, very much opposed to Nehru's industrialized vision, also as being virtuous, as being something which needed a certain kind of patriotism to be offered to village economies. So what I want to really ask you is how did Chen justify wealth and virtue? How does he balance both, especially in the context of mass culture and profits? What was, and you know, and was the everyday nature of his manufacturing, is it really different in a sense from large formal industries? And how is this virtue and patriotism to be located vis-a-vis -vis especially his artful deceptions in pursuit of profit, right? He is, like you said, often like Barnum in the sense that he has all these promotional schemes. So how does he, how does he justify this virtue in the face of all of that? And in this social world that you recreate in the 20th century, are there technologies that have more virtue attached to them than others? So that was one of the themes I had relating to the ideas that Chen seems to put forward. The second really fascinating theme is the world that you build of consumers. Um, and, and Chen's plot throughout these writings and throughout uh, all the columns that he offers is that he reaches out in some ways already to households that have access to tacit knowledge there's the production of rose rouge, scented soaps, toothpaste, and fragrant hair oils. All of that are absolutely, and scented soaps, fast, absolutely fascinating. But what I was thinking about is that consumption is also about shaping social identities. In the work of uh, Arjun Apadore, in Freitag's work, what you have is the making of a public culture, but also the emergence of some very concrete social hierarchies that emerge. So I was interested in what kinds of new hierarchies, new kinds of subordination, social subordination are also at place here. After all, when you have cash-based consumption, when that happens in India in the early 20th century, there are certain families who can afford these new fashions and others who can't. So what is really being reshaped here in terms of social hierarchies um, and also the act of production itself? This is what really interested me. When you think about production as opposed to consumption, there are historians of technology who've argued that Europeans had a sense of hegemonic power that was superior to and different because they produced and others in other parts of the world in the colonies consumed, right? So there's a difference between the production and this is, I think it was Michael Adas who talks about this. So when we think about this, is Chen deploying the difference between the power of production in China versus consumption? What happens when you produce is that different from being a consumer of goods from other parts of the world. The third theme I had was to bring out what you have said about labor. You know, what is the recognition and value of labor? And I think you've explained this really in a very nuanced way. And I thought that was one of the, the most, the parts of the book that I learned so much from. So I wanted like, for us to again discuss what is this difference between creativity and copying Authentic, authenticity and replication. You know, how does Chen really valorize these translated technologies? And are we again, you know, I was referring to the work of Winnie Wong when she, in Van Gogh On Demand, China and the Ready-Made, she looks at these painters in Dafen and she says they are alienated as Chinese copyists of original Western masterpieces. So I really want to ask about how, how is that kind of labor valued? And uh, finally, if, if one is writing the history of entrepreneurship and capitalist development, how do we address the social nexus of work and the working class? Uh, it, do they get kind of put into the margins of history or how do we make sure that through that, there's a way in which we can address that nexus as well? And I think you have allusions to that in your book when he's dealing with his workers. So I wanted to kind of uh, understand how you did that. So again, thank you. This is a book which I will be able to use when I'm teaching histories of medicine technology in South Asia. It's hugely cross-cutting and it's absolutely uh, seminal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Eugenia, you want to uh, give a brief answer, response? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you all three of you. Um, your comments uh, as always uh, and your friendship over the years have uh, have inspired me and uh, many of you uh, your imprint is in the book I hope you all saw 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 some of that but um, and and 
one of the reasons why I asked the three of you to be on the panels was I knew you'd ask wonderful questions. And three of you, I think altogether, there's like 14 questions I've written down. So there's no way that I'm gonna be able to answer all of them. Um, but maybe what I'll do is um, sort of go through and pick out a couple um, from each of you um, or one maybe from each of you. Um, and uh, uh, Debbie brought up the issue of family life and uh, in relation to the issue of science and affect, one of the um, sort of themes that I, I do pursue in, in the book. Chen Xian himself actually presents himself as a, as a man of feeling who writes romance novels um, and indeed uh, uses this almost as a shield to pursue profit Right, it's because he's such a sentiment, and this will bring up actually some of the questions that both Kabita and Jing brought up. But as a sentimental man, that, that genuineness, and the authentic sentiment that he writes and pours into his novels, uh, that's virtue actually in the Chinese context, right? I mean, that, that kind of qing, that in, in Chinese, this goes back to my earlier work, but that notion of being kind of an, uh, genuinely expressive, right? Um, it was actually very crucial for him to uh, fend off critics uh, that uh, identi identified him as a pen for hire. And this is where class does come in. And that was another question I think many of you, brought, a couple of you brought up. You know, it's, um, you know, May 4th, like what kind of, how do you, what register is this labor? The intellectual labor that he was engaging in was highly commercialized. These sentimental novels were, they were like, you know, melodramatic, you know, they sold like hotcakes, right? I mean, this is not, lofty stuff and sort of middle, very middle brow, right? The sort of May 4th intellectuals looked at scans at Mandarin Duck and Butterfly fiction, right? This was stuff that you did that's retrograde, right? Um, and instead you should do much loftier um, uh, uh, verna you know, vernacular in, in, in terms of Baihua, May 4th vernacular, uh, a serious novel writing. Right, Chen Jiexian, both his novel writing and the way he presented his science was exceedingly um, commercial. It was, and, and because he was selling both his novels and his publications on science and selling the knowledge about science, uh, would write in kind of a, a sort of classified, uh, commercialized classical Chinese, and it was dripping in sentimentality. Um, so the sentiment was actually very crucial for him to navigate commercial work. And, and capitalism, uh, be, precisely because, you know, profit had, you know, traditionally been sort of deemed as very uh, unnecessary or not, not, it's like, you know, getting, getting one literati's hands dirty, right? Um, so, so the science and affect question is actually a pretty, that's actually how I initially got into him because my previous work was on, on affect. Um, and uh, Chin's family life uh, is kind of in the background uh, with this. And I think perhaps that's that family life issue is probably less related to the affect per se. I mean, I think that there he's tapping into kind of ongoing literati culture, uh, but family life was actually very important for labor issues. Um, and this gets to Kavita's last question about sort of forms of labor that emerged under um, Chen. Um, so initially when it was a small company, his the labor, he used family labor. He had a translation bureau that uh, he would use his 12 and 13 year old son and daughter to act as scribes, right? This is a translate. He himself didn't speak any English. So he had one friend who knew all these languages and who would take Sherlock Holmes, you know, in, uh, in English or take, uh, you know, this German tract on, on legal philosophy. And then he would just read it out loud. And then his children would act as scribes, translating what he, um, what the, the 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 colleague was reading out loud in vernacular in, in in spoken Chinese into a classical script, and Chen was the last guy on this assembly line and would take the final text and then add his comments. And this was translation with intent. He had actually a term. Uh, it, it was intentional uh, in our. Uh, intervention in the act of translation. He did that with his knowledge work through and through. So, um, but the, that, that does bring the issue of labor, right? It, in this small scale, uh, and he did similarly when he was making the tooth powder because that was very easy assembly, right? So he, he used family and he would never give them credit, right? Chen Deixian was the face, he was the brand. His wife did a lot of the translation work. She never got the credit. So a lot of hidden labor. And similarly, uh, you know, when they did scale up to large factories, right? By the end, he had like 15 some factories. Uh, 400 um, uh, people working for him and uh, majority women, right? So I think, you know, I think it was, and, and that he had female managers, you know, again, because this kind of industrial work uh, really required, was increasingly sort of, you know, a suit, uh, uh, sort of taken on by female uh, laborers. So, so Kavita, that just kind of gets to your question about kind of, you know, the different forms of labor that kind of emerged. Um, and there's been fantastic work done on factory work uh, and new work that's being done on factory work. So I actually didn't delve too much into that and it was also partially due to the limits of the materials that I have. 
Um, and I and uh, but and then Jing had also this larger question about um, this kind of thinking of you know kind of you know how um, you know how one off is he right in the sense that um, and and how is he very much a product of a period and I think you're absolutely right right I mean he is a product of a period. Um, where um, it was kind of prior to mass industrialization. Uh, it was kind of a period where um, mass factories were just starting to emerge. He was on the cusp. Um, and so the way that work and industrial processes were arranged allowed for the individual tinkering that was occurring. And I would say this is not specific to China at all, right? You had the age of inventors, um, you know, in late 19th century throughout the world, right? Early 20th century. Um, so, um, and it was very much predicated on how um, the domains of science and industry were defined. And what you do see uh, in the Chinese context with Chen as well is that that eventually becomes formalized and monopolized by, in the, in, in the realm of knowledge, right? Academia, like, you know, it's it's science and chemistry was no longer to be published in these sort of sentimental women's magazines, but were to be put into uh, textbooks and taught in um, the academic world. And similarly, industry in the Chinese case, it's not private industry, uh, but it's going to be a state-sponsored industry that monopolizes a lot of the activity. Um, I, I, I want to keep I, I'm an eye on the time, so I don't know if Shangwei, do we have time to collect some questions or? How does this work? Uh, yes, we have already received some questions and uh, uh, have you answered, basically you've done your response? Uh, I, well, I'm just a little bit worried about time. Their, their questions yeah. are all so fabulous. I, I think I did touch on all three of them, some of the uh, topics and issues. So uh, okay. that's fine. I think you, you can just have two more minutes. Uh, okay. Finish. Right, yeah, and then we'll okay. go to the audience, yeah. Okay, so, and the other thing that Jing uh, brought up too is um, sort of this issue of Shanzhai and copy culture, and um, which is something I explore a little bit in the, um, uh, uh, the, the conclusion of the book, right? And where I kind of um, sort of explore contemporary practices of knockoff manufacturing that take place in Shenzhen. Uh, and the point of my exploration, and I also look at the Great Leap Forward, and, and it was not so much to suggest a direct causality, which is what a lot of historians like to do, right? Oh, what happened in the early 20th century then led to the Great Leap Forward and then led to um, Shanghai. Uh, rather, I wanted to uh, do a couple things. I wanted to, with the Shanghai case, I actually wanted to, um, you know, address how the historical case could allow us to rethink some of the debates around Shanghai because Shanghai culture is bemoaned by um, sort of neoliberal uh, commentators about China as typical of Chinese copycat activities and counterfeiting, right? Uh, but there's also kind of a, um, a romanticization of Shanghai uh, where, by uh, sort of new makers communities who celebrate this kind of garage and grassroots, you know, um, do it yourself. Um, manufacturing, um, which the state, the Chinese communist state, actually social post-socialist state uh, actually uh, tries to appropriate um, as sort of mass manufacturing, mass making, it celebrates what's going on in uh, Shenzhen. Um, so my point was not to say that A caused B, uh, but rather to kind of get out of this debate about sort of, is this a neoliberal crisis or is this a post-socialist romanticized ideal, um, Shanghai, it just behooves us to kind of think about how, um, you know, historically there are uh, uh, sort of circumstances where um, sort of scrappy and um, somewhat rogue um, processes uh, allow for very innovative approaches uh, in, in, in terms of making things and manufacturing things. Um, and I also wanted to use the opportunity to kind of think about why, and this is actually leading to my third book, where which is called Making the Chinese Copycat, uh, which is to kind of look at both the early 20th century and the late, you know, the early 21st century as moments where China is really um, making a splash in, in, in the global market. Um, and generates uh, behaves similarly because it, there's a sense that it has to catch up and it has to it, it has to you know sort of be very scrappy in its ability to uh, you know adapt technologies and to to produce um, and how that might actually generate uh, considerable anxiety um, and 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 the conditions for that in, that anxiety of Chinese uh, producers being copycats is very very different in the early 20th century 
um, versus the 21st century. So certainly that's not meant to, to sort of equate the two. Uh, but but it was a, a kind of a way also for me just to kind of think as I move forward to my third <laughs> to my third book. Uh, so Shang Wei, maybe I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, uh, Eugenia. I think we have uh, received a number of questions, and let me begin with uh, this short one. Uh, can everyone see this on your screen? Um, no. Um, let me see. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see it. I click double click, click it, and uh, it's gone. It's about the um, the tooth powder. Okay, uh, is that? A, you know, let me paraphrase. <laughs> I don't I couldn't see the question. Is that it was first invented in Japan and somehow, you know, out of fashion. And then, then you know, so I think the attention is particularly uh, credited for creating Chinese version of it, right? And uh, so can you tell us more about this, uh, you know, this is a Shangzhan, the trade war, <laughs> you know, and then in the kind of a nationalist kind of spirit, right? Um, can you say more about that? Yeah, so the Japanese were actually uh, his direct opponents. They were known as the, in this um, native national products movement, Guohou Yundong, right? Uh, the uh, primary target for Chen Dexian were, were Japanese brands, uh, particular Japanese brands of tooth powder. So, so certainly Chen Dexian was not the first to invent tooth powder. I mean, tooth powder was actually used before toothpaste globally. Um, and uh, so, so uh, Japan was um, a uh, enemy, uh, introducing enemy products, uh, including tooth powder. So the, the primary target in the tooth powder war was Japan specifically. Um, but this does go back to um, sort of uh, Jing's comment about how Shangdan, it started yet yeah, far before Chen Diexian, right? I mean, the late, late, late 19th century, you had uh, notions of Shangzhan, right? And China was um, dealing both on the, on the scale, you know, within the self-strengthening movement, there was uh, heavy industry. And that's because, you know, state sponsorship enabled uh, the possibility for these sort of uh, arsenals. Um, and arsenals were, um, uh, you know, where, you know, China was being forced to kind of come up with, you know, gunboats and, and uh, large um, cannon, fought, cannon and so on and so forth in, in a period where they were being brutally decimated by gunboat diplomacy by Western imperialists. And they were uh, competing uh, with uh, oftentimes Japanese um, naval war sh uh, shipyards, although uh, uh, one of my students is also showing a great deal of collaboration that takes place between uh, the Japanese and the Chinese during the self-strengthening movement. Um, but that tension uh, uh, between the Japanese and the Chinese as competitors um, in trade war uh, is clearly much earlier than, than this moment. So maybe I'll keep it at that. Shang Wei, if you have another. Okay, good. So I, I just wonder, I, you know, should I click type answer to display the question here? Okay. You, I have a. Shang Wei, yeah. you just click um, answer live and the audience. Answer live, right? So everyone can see it? Okay. Um, this question from Sarah. I'm glad that Sarah is here. Uh, so it's a. It, Anyone, can anyone see it? Uh, can all, we all see it yeah, on the screen? Yeah. Right, right, it's a congratulations. And then also this is a comment um, and ties in some, you know, with some of the uh, wonderful responses on the Zoom where other figures from the period come to mind as the parallels with the Chen, with Chen Dexian, right? For me, no surprise, the, the person who comes to mind is S.G. Wells. And I not know that Sarah has written a book. Uh, about him, uh, especially thinking about the Debbie's comment about the overstated in insistence on the two cultures as dominating in the 20th century, right? Uh, another similarity is both Chen and Wells seem to uh, represent a kind of a generalist uh, spirit, uh, yet not to be, uh, you know, in the kind of genteel man of letters form, but rather in the more kind of modern modernized form. Where sciences or where science, technology, marketing appeal to mass culture, etc., are brought together with a pragmatic, non-specialized imagination. Does the, the resonate? Does this resonate for you? 
Yeah, Sarah, thank you for your comment. Absolutely. Actually, I remember Mon I was having a conversation with Monica Miller uh, over the summer when we were socially distancing on a uh, picnic, uh, and I think she's here. Uh, but in any case, uh, she brought up H.G. Wells, um, and the two do resonate very, very much. Um, uh, I didn't actually explore H.G. Wells in the book, although now I have to go read your book to, to kind of pursue this a little bit more. Uh, who I actually likened him to, uh, Chen to, was uh, another fellow um, uh, from 20th century uh, US uh, literary and science history, uh, Hugo Gernsbeck, uh, who was a science fiction writer who also published um, magazines, sort of radio technology, like radio enthusiasts, these sorts of uh, early 20th century popular journals on technology. And, and, and he had a whole fellowship of tinkerers. Um, and indeed, a Society of Fellows um, uh, postdoc a few years ago wrote a fabulous book on him, uh, Grant Whitehoff. Um, and uh, um, it, my comparison of the two was to kind of think about how the relationship between kind of the mechanical reproduction of words uh, opened up uh, avenues of sharing and disseminating knowledge to a much broader audience, um, knowledge that might uh, eventually would be more specialized, uh, but that might have originally been within the purview of the gentlemanly uh, culture, right? Sort of more highbrow literati or, uh, or, or um, uh, gentleman scientists. Um, but because of this mass media that was emerging during this time, Chen Diexian and uh, Hugo Gernsbeck uh, were actually able to kind of uh, um, really break down those boundaries of access to knowledge. And, um, and uh, this was actually crucial for both of them because they were making knowledge common that was oftentimes, it, it, that was becoming branded as, as owned by corporations, right? Um, in the US, it was RCA and uh, AT&T, you know, people who are trying to, corporations that were trying to monopolize certain technologies for electronics and, and radios. Uh, and for Chen Dixian, it was it was foreign companies, transnational companies that wanted to keep secret. You know, Burroughs Welcoming Company didn't want everyone ripping off their formula for hazeline snow, but Chen Dixian insisted that it was common knowledge and it was virtuous as Kavita was bringing up, right? There was a moral element, it was tied to the nation state building practice. Um, so, so thank you, Sarah, for your comment. Uh, Shangwei, you're, you're muted, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Here we have a question for uh, Deborah. Um, and also, you know, follow up, you know, the questions for, for Eugenia. I mean, this question is pretty long. And I think you can you can read on screen. I don't want to read aloud again. Uh, it's about the uh, linguistic of a vernacular, right? It's a kind of a Euro European versus China, you know, in the case study here, right? And, uh, um, and also the, uh, about the, uh, um, the anxiety, right? Of uh, creating kind of vernacular, linguistic vernacular. Uh, and uh, how do you compare with the European case with the Chinese case here, right? Uh, so this is for Deborah, and then also the uh, follow-up question is also on this. Uh, um, no, yeah, I think we can we can deal with this question first. All right. Uh, so Debbie, can you are you here? Thanks. Um, so the question, as I understand it, was why is it that mm -hmm. English speakers never experience this anxiety about right. appropriating right. words from other languages? Mm -hmm. um, you know. I, so I think that is the condition of an imperial nation. Um, I think that we have to understand the anxiety, at least as I'm familiar with it in the Central European case, as about cultural autonomy, right? So having a language that um, does not rely on um, foreign neologisms was for the nation builders of East Central Europe in the early 19th century, a path to cultural autonomy when they didn't even see political autonomy as a possibility on the horizon, right? So this is when they're, you know, essentially accepting of um, the multinational Habsburg state framework that they want cultural autonomy and independence of language is crucial to that. Maybe Eugenia can speak to um, the significance in the Chinese case. Um, yeah, so I think, um, no, there's this anxiety of, uh, 
you know, I mean, the, I mean, the translation of technical knowledge into Chinese has always been extremely difficult, precisely because it's not a Roman language, and there are huge debates about exactly how to do this. Um, and, uh, but you know, it's you know, I think somebody like Michael Gordon has done fantastic work on uh, sort of how scientific knowledge and scientific language actually it was actually quite um, not standardized for a long, long time um, and, until the early twentieth century, and there was complete friction in acts of translation from one language to another. Um, and English was not the dominant, you know, German uh, for a long time dominated or, you know, you know, you know, the sort of scientific literature. Um, and so the, the practice of translation was always extremely fraught. And um, that in and of itself generated anxiety. But I, I do think the point of kind of the, you know, those who were seeing themselves increasingly as falling behind, uh, that fraughtness, which was universal, uh, became more of a marker of their failure or their inability to kind of access that kind of knowledge. All right. Uh, it's a lighthearted question, but the important one. <laughs> Let's, and then I'll go to uh, two interrelated questions. Okay. Um, have the uh, recipes in the book been recreated? You know, have you done the lab work <laughs> to, to show whether it works or not? You know? Yeah. So I have actually tried a, a couple of the more modest ones um, with like rose petals to kind of try to make soap, but it's actually really hard because a lot of the recipes don't have, the ones that I was looking at, they don't have quantities, um, which was really fascinating. They didn't kind of, so maybe there was a whole different genre of kind of recipe making where people just kind of felt their way through it. I, you know, I needed, the exact amount to figure out. Some did, but um, some didn't. Uh, the one that I was trying didn't. So my 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 uh, my uh, my experiment actually ended in disaster. Uh, but I did actually, uh, funnily enough, the cover of. I'll show you. This is like the cover of my book. This is a. Um, if you can see it, that is actually a container from the 1930s that held Chen Diexian's tooth powder, and I found it online at an old bazaars. Uh, old like a uh, you know it's a, you know sort of a collector's um, website um, where uh, they sold antique items and uh, I was able to get my hand on on the uh, tooth powder case and when I got it from China I opened it up and there was tooth powder in it um, and so I brought it to a chemist. Uh, to have uh, him identify uh, the ingredients and I compared it to the recipe of Chen Diexian's and lo and behold, it was exactly, exactly right. So, um, so, so I was able to, uh, uh, so he, he didn't, you know, he, he, he was into the art of deception, but apparently his tooth powder was actually pretty accurate according to his recipe. Oh, thank you. Um, and we have a, question here about the tickling. Uh, I think this is a, uh, uh, the question that I think you can see here. Fantastic panel. Thank you. I found the discussion about tickling as a notion to revise the narrative about the modernity. Very thought provoking and tickling is an uh, important category in studies on consumption under communism, right? And it appears in histories of developmental states in which tickling is essential to make foreign technologies work in the local context. Uh, so just any further comments on this, uh, particularly uh, comment on the tickling changed in communist China? Yeah, so that Malgoja, thank you for your um, question. Uh, yeah, the tinkering concept was just really uh, uh, a way for me to kind of, um, you know, challenge notions of radical, invention, uh, quantum leaps in technology as being the basis of, you know, discovery um, and, and being something that was very unique in the making of the Industrial Revolution. I really wanted to get away from that narrative uh, and instead think much more complexly about what, you know, might I say was is quite universal in processes of making that it involves a lot of these kind of micro um, changes here, changes there. Um, I would say also in textual work, uh, certainly for Chen Jiexian, for myself, when, mm -hmm. <laughs> when I edit this book, boy, there was a lot of tinkering involved. Um, but uh, I do think uh, that it is um, a very useful category. Uh, and I purposefully wanted to, you know, 
you know, I, I, when I presented this once at a humanity center conversation in UT Austin, a woman who does British literature was also loved the idea because tinkers come from, you think about Irish tinkerers, right? They're people who are itinerant um, uh, menders of pots and they would, you know, uh, mend the pots, not necessarily in a particularly successful way. Like the, the, the mended pot would oftentimes not be that much uh, improved, right? It was meant to really just kind of, um, and it's, it's, it's a trope that has been, um, you know, quite negative in, in Irish literature. These are oftentimes almost gypsy-like um, uh, itinerant menders. Um, and uh, she, she, she thought that this was kind of a wonderful kind of reversal of this trope to put it in this context where you can uh, uh, not dismiss this idea of tinkering as something um, incomplete, uh, not as uh, uh, effective as, you know, invention anew or invention ex nihilo. So I actually, precisely because it was sort of seen as desultory repair, not effect, not, not invention, that I liked the concept. Um, and uh, yeah, communism, I know Malgoja works on that, um, I think is also, and, and it becomes useful in the sense of when you think about uh, sort of scarce, you know, conditions of scarcity, mm -hmm. um, it almost becomes a default. Um, kind of approach that you need you need in order to, to to remain competitive or become competitive, right? And so I think periods of communism as well that that this was very much uh, the case. Uh, I, I take um, seriously what Jing, who had to actually leave early, uh, said though about how you know the communist moment is different from the early twentieth century moment in the Chinese context. Um, the Great Leap Forward was a period of heavy industry was actually. Um, the thing that was being privileged uh, by the state and all resources were being poured into it as opposed to this kind of small scale light manufacturing work. Um, and, and indeed it was a radical experimentation to get uh, the masses involved in tinkering and in, in, in their production of making steel pots, right? So it was a, the politics of it were utterly different than what I see in uh, my Tian case. And I think that's what's important is really kind of thinking about the political economic context to understand these acts of tinkering that could be quite different. I think the politics, Eugenia, also, I mean, in India in the 1950s and 60s, responding to Malgorzia, there was the politics of socialism tied to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but again, a, a certain kind of tinkering because for the sake of nationalism, you didn't want products from the US and other places and Europe to flood your market. So you closed it and then decided to tinker by yourself. We had, I grew up not drinking Coke, but something called thumbs up, whatever it was. So you had all these substitutes through, right. through a long part of your life, which were, were you know, consumer substitutes, but it was based on small industries, tinkering in many ways without the state promoting it. But just because of taste, people wanted that. So in some ways, you know, so the, uh, the, the Welcomes Barrow Snow, what was it called? The Hazeline Snow. Hazeline Snow. In India, we would get Afghan Snow, which was uh, similar. But, you know, everyone was trying to jip Welcome, welcome Barrows in some way uh, and, and produce the same stuff, you know, very interesting. Great. Uh, here we have a follow-up question, actually. Uh, I think it's, uh, can you see this? Um, Fang Ziyang, Huang Ziyang. Uh, it's a about the state, uh, you know, the re relationship between the state and the vernacular industrialists, uh, especially on, you know, within the contemporary context. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what uh, uh, Eugenia, have, you know, has to say about this. Okay, so I'm just trying to, Ziyang, uh, I'm trying to read the, so the Shanghai phenomenon has been decimated by the Chinese state led right. uh, yeah. stricter regulation on intellectual properties. While in your book, Chen also sought to help the nationalists Right. Yeah, no, this, the, the role of the state's quite different, absolutely. And that's what I mean about sort of trying to understand these acts of rogue manufacturing and tinkering within their specific uh, political economic contexts. Um, and uh, the Chen Jie Xian's, um, uh, the nationalist state, and this is back to Kavita's uh, comment about how uh, the, the Indian state within the colonial and early post-colonial era, right, these were uh, kind of efforts of base uh, of, of import substitution that were being celebrated as um, uh, integral to, anti, it's an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist act of production. And um, the um, state uh, in early 20th century context of Chin was much weaker than the Shanghai context of the 20, 21st century. Um, and the nationalist regime was, you know, coming out of, you know, 
period of internecine, internecine warfare among warlords and so on and so forth, and it was very weak. Uh, and industry was being actually built mostly from below with little state support. Um, so Chin was very active in uh, helping bolster state industry and the state eventually kind of uh, appropriated uh, Chen's notion of gai liang, uh, improvement as the basis of how to commend um, this import substitution producing kind of manufacturing that Chen was engaged in. All right, uh, I think this is a, um, another question is also follow is some uh, is most relevant to the uh, um, uh, this ongoing discussion. That is, um, um, mm. Victor's. I, is that, are you looking at Victor's? Oh, oh, this is a different one. Let me see. Um, There's one from Ron, right? Um, okay. From Victor. Have you seen this? Oh, yeah, so Victor's, Victor's question, yeah. right? I think, uh, so he's talking about the Shanjai maker movement and it's important to be suspicious of the celebratory narrative around the maker movement. Um, mm -hmm. And then his point is very well taken. There are other forms of smaller scale local production mm -hmm. often left out of makers, maker narratives, right? Not part of like Shenzhen, Shanjai, right? Um, that, and they, in this late industrial moment are deemed to be more desirable, higher quality, more sustainable. Um, and tapping into the idea of the artisanal. Um, certain things that were seen as signs of weakness in Chen's time, like having to locally source cuttlefish bones, becoming strengths in our present. How might we square such forms of production with Shanzhai as fellow heirs of early 20th century industrial vernacularism? So I think this is a really, you know, complicates um, the 21st century much more than I did in my, in my uh, conclusion, which was uh, for me just the initial foray into the contemporary moment and was meant to be very, very suggestive. And, uh, and, and perhaps the um, phenomenon of these local smaller scale production that aren't part of the celebrated maker movement of, of Shenzhen is actually more similar to what you might find uh, in the early 21st century. Uh, but I actually um, am gonna leave that open and I look forward to Victor's work, uh, which will hopefully help me, I know he's working on this, uh, help uh, me and the field know more about that. Sorry, that's a little bit of a <laughs> cop out, but it is something that I think uh, Victor knows much more than I do. And I, and I do look forward to his fabulous work on it. Okay, so I think that, um, uh, I have one more question. All right, so I think we'll have well, okay, right, um, in, in terms of a time. Uh, it's a very short question here. Uh, uh, was there uh, any interweaving mm -hmm. of uh, products among, uh, the, among his literature? So, yeah, so, um, you know, so he wrote a lot. Uh, so I did not read everything that he wrote. Um, I actually only focused on one of his, um, uh, more famous novels, uh, which is in English, it's translated uh, as uh, Money Demon. Uh, and in that, um, it's not so much products that he featured. I actually read that novel to explore how he and his peers uh, and his readers um, dealt with the issue of profit. Um, so the Money Demon is somewhat semi-autobiographical and it's about a man struck uh, or sort of befuddled by multiple love interests and the, but his real uh, love of his life um he can't quite marry and uh because he doesn't have enough money and she doesn't have enough money and and so their true love can't be pursued and so um um you know so so it's it's a, it's a novel about the anxiety of money that this generation was dealing with um so i i do do that read there, but I also look at some of his early poetry writings. Um, they're known as bamboo branch poetry, uh, and in that he uh, explores, um, it, he writes this as an early, uh, in, when, in his days in Hangzhou, where he's exploring um, different kinds of technologies that dot the Hangzhou landscape. Um, this included uh, a uh, photography, like, um, it included uh, rubber wheel tires uh, on new forms of carriages. Um, it included um, 
the factory mill where women would um, kind of stream out uh, at five o'clock on the dot, right? So new female labor. And, and that particular poem was so fascinating because it really resonated with uh, Lumiere's film uh, that also featured, it was one of the first motion picture films uh, that featured women coming out of French factories. Um, it was uncannily uh, similar. So my guess is that Chen Dixian knew about that film uh, and appropriated uh, that narrative into uh, a very short uh, bamboo branch poem. Um, so, so literature definitely allowed him to explore and domesticate foreign technologies uh, for both himself and his readers. All right, so I, I have to, you know, our colleague Maddie, uh, Maddie Zalen uh, raised a question here. Uh, even in the period of uh, in, Chen was working, uh, we're beginning to see innovation, right, in investment and organization production. Did the Chinese commitment to what you have called vernacular industrialism preclude innovation in financing and organization for production? Yeah. No, so this is an excellent question. And, uh, you know, the sources that I had on his organizational um, practices and his financial, the financial arrangements of his uh, firm were very, very limited. Um, basically, I just had a couple of lists describing kind of, you know, yearly how much he would make. Uh, I had sort of sketches, uh, reports um, made by other, um, you know, by reporters who visited his factory, who would kind of describe the conditions of the factory. Um, and I had lists of kind of uh, the labor, uh, but very little um, in, um, sort of on the organization of production or on, on kind of the business side of things. Um, you know, so that was a little frustrating. I, I will say also that I think um, your own work and many others in businesses where you have done already uh, really wonderful, you know, Elizabeth Cole's work, for example, um, has done wonderful work um, on kind of the organization and business, the history of business practices in uh, early 20th century, um, um, uh, you know, businesses, including, um, you know, textiles and, and for your work is on salt merchants. So, so in a way, I kind of purposely uh, stayed away from it. Um, to shed more light on kind of what I'm calling these quite kind of ad hoc vernac vernacular practices um, that, that kind of fall out when you do kind of a company focused um, analyses. Virginia, were there, uh, I mean, in, in a lot of no, uh, non-Western capitalism, yeah. there are, I mean, to build on Maddie's question, often there yeah. are these networks, family and kinship networks yeah. that help you finance your loans, that help you to, you know, that help you to negotiate contracts. So what was that network around him? apart from his family and children working in yeah. with him, was that also kind of some a network that, that was there? Because it was there in India in this early capitalism. No, I mean, that, that's a very normal social practice, absolutely. Uh, but I had no evidence of how he did it. I mean, the only kind of information I got, and this might also be partially this, you know, I mean, I had to read a lot of this hagiographical hey, literature and I had to kind of read between the lines. So a lot of it was focusing on kind of, you know, he sacrificed all the proceeds that he made from his uh, writing in order to found and establish in 1980, 1918, this Association for Domestic Industry, right? Um, and that was it, it was very opaque. Um, so uh, so the hints at, you know, you know, in terms of labor, I could also kind of read between the lines and, you know, there was a whole kind of narrative in some of the materials about how, how mechanized was his factory. And uh, he wanted to present he did have some machines, but they were modest. And in fact, he was dedicated to supporting, um, you know, the laborers who he treated like family, right? Uh, you can read between the lines and say, yeah, because labor is so cheap in China. So that's why he was going to do that rather than completely mechanized. And there was also this other larger context of, of he didn't want his company to be taxed if he, you know, so there was a kind of a government initiative about foreign, uh, it's not foreign made projects, pro not foreign made products, but products that were known as foreign style products were identified if they're made by machinery and you would have, you would be taxed more. So he was very purposeful in presenting his, his, um, his, his industry, his, his factories as humble and modest. Um, but the finance side was very opaque to me, unfortunately. 
All right, so I think it's running really late. It's uh, 5.30, uh, so let's wrap up the uh, panel. And, you know, I just want to remind our audience the uh, bookseller link in the chat box uh, to get a copy of the book to read, and if you haven't done so, right? So once again, I want to uh, congratulate my colleague, Eugenia Lin, for this remarkable book. Uh, and I want to thank all the panelists. Um, a very lively and productive discussion. Uh, and also, yes, I, I want to thank uh, Kay Chang of uh, Hyman Center for all the, for the uh, technical assistance that she has provided for us, uh, without which the panel would not be uh, possible. Right? Uh, so I think that's, that's all for today. Uh, and I hope to uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I encourage everyone to buy a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you yes. all. Yeah. Thank you all Thank for coming. You. Yeah.